copper is essential for our modern lives. We need the copper wiring in our electronic equipment, in our cars, in our homes. And in fact, copper is becoming more and more important now as the energy transition gathers pace. We need it not only in electric vehicles, which require more copper than your traditional combustion engine, but also in your wind farms, solar panels, and when we're connecting these to the electric grid. But where does copper actually come from? Copper is a relatively common element in the crust, and copper deposits form in a variety of geological environments. I will summarize the range of copper deposit types in another video, but for now, let's focus on one very specific deposit type. One of the most important copper sources and deposit types is the so-called porphyry deposit type. So let's have a look at what these porphyry copper deposits actually are. Porphyry copper deposits are currently the largest single source of copper ore globally. Porphyry deposits form by hot hydrothermal fluids originating from magma chambers deeper in the crust. Apart from copper, many porphyry deposits also contain economic amounts of other metals, such as molybdenum, silver or gold. In fact, some porphyry deposits are mined chiefly for these other metals rather than copper. Let's have a closer look at the characteristics of porphyry deposits and how they form. The occurrence of porphyry deposits is very closely associated with plate tectonics. You can only really find them along active margins where one lithospheric plate dives under or subducts another plate. When this happens, the mantle, which is under the lithosphere, starts melting. If the conditions are right, these melts contain metals such as copper. Some of the melts will crystallize along the way, but some of it travels higher in the crust, finally settling as porphyry intrusions, typically somewhere between 5 and 10 kilometers below the surface. The melts that make it this far will contain a lot of water and other vapour phases dissolves into the melt. When the porphyry intrusion is formed in the crust and starts to cool and crystallise, the vapour starts to get released from the melt. This results in a build-up of the fluid pressure in the magma chamber, causing extensive fracturing of the caprock and allowing the hot hydrothermal fluids to enter the fracture porosity. The chemical reactions between the fluids and the country rock and the rapid decrease in pressure and temperature causes the ore minerals to precipitate from the fluids. Porphyry ore deposits formed in this way can have very, very large volumes so that they can be economic even at very low copper concentrations. But sometimes the failure is more localised, allowing a more sudden release of the fluid pressure. The catastrophic drop in the pressure causes the host rock to fracture extensively, so that a pipe-like feature filled with the brecciated host rock forms. Or minerals precipitate from the fluids in the fractures between the host rock fragments, effectively forming the matrix of the breccia. So the breccia pipes, although usually small, are typically the richest part of a porphyry system in terms of ore grade. But the fracturing of the country rock and the escape of any remaining fluids doesn't necessarily stop there. It is very common in porphyry systems that fracturing goes on for quite some time after the intrusion 
as not all fluids will escape at once. As the still warm fluids keep entering the country rock, they travel upwards and sideways and cool, forming a convective cell around the intrusion. The fluids are usually in chemical disequilibrium with the country rocks they pass through, so they will cause alteration of the country rocks. The style and characteristics of this alteration depends on the fluid chemistry and the fluid temperature and of course of the composition of the country rock. The fluid chemistry changes as the fluids react with the surrounding rocks so that there is an evolution in the fluid chemistry along the fluid pathway. The fluids cool down as well, which further changes how they react with the country rocks. All these changes are further enhanced by the tendency of the convective cells to draw in meteoric waters from the surface as well. And these meteoric waters mix with the hydrothermal fluids. The neat thing is that we know a good deal of how the fluids and therefore the alteration is likely to evolve in these systems. That means that we can make some predictions of what kind of alteration we can expect in different parts of the convective cell. The zoning will of course be quite complex in natural systems, especially in those that involve several magmatic episodes so you often get overprinting of earlier alteration zones by alteration caused by later fluids. But by and large, the inner parts of the system usually contain so-called potassic and phyllic alteration zones. The potassic alteration is typified by micas and salmon pink alteration minerals such as autoclase while phyllic alteration is dominated by silicification and sericitic alteration. As the fluid chemistry changes, the alteration further out changes to propylitic alteration. Chlorides and epidotes are very common in this alteration zone, resulting from alteration of mafic minerals such as biotite or amphibole. Farther out, where the meteoric waters mix with the hydrothermal fluids, a white sulphide alteration zone forms. This is typically expressed by extensive precipitation of pyrite in a halo-like ring around the porphyry. Finally, in most systems, you can also find an argillic alteration in the coolest epithermal part of the convection cell. This type of alteration is chiefly expressed by clay minerals as a result of alteration of feldspars and mafic minerals in the original rock. If the sulfur activity in the fluid is low, you can also get carbonate mineralization in this part of the system. Ideally, we can then use so-called vectoring to try to find new deposits. This means trying to work out the zoning pattern around a suspected porphyry deposit in order to hopefully find the ore. The alteration around a copper porphyry deposit can get really, really quite complex, but it is very important to be able to recognize the different alteration styles in different parts of the system. In exploration, the zonation is often used to try to hone in a vector into the copper-rich ore. So let's have a look at an example of what some of the alteration zones around a copper porphyry intrusion might look like. I'm visiting an old copper porphyry mine in North Wales, just north of the town of Dolgetli. It's a rather wet day, but the weather is improving. 
But before heading to see the mine and the alteration zoning around the porphyry, I want to have a look at the country rocks, just to understand what the unaltered rocks look like. Well, these are the metasediments that host the intrusions around here. Let's have a closer look at these ones first. The country rocks here consist of volcanic and siliciclastic sediments. Lots of mica, feldspars and quartz in this locality here. You can see the original layering, although there is some quite strong schistosity too. There are some fractures coming through and these seem to bring in some sulphide rich fluids causing some iron staining. This might be the first hint that there might be something going on in the area. But overall, they look like pretty regular metasedimentary rocks. So these rocks haven't been affected by any hydrothermal activity from the intrusions. They are unaltered. But what about the ore deposit then? What can we observe in the field? Well, let's see now what happens when we go up the hill. The Glastia mine, about five kilometers north of Dolgetli, was historically mined for copper. And in fact, some of the copper ore processing techniques still used today were developed here. You can still visit the old mine site and what remains of the workings. You can actually see that some of the rocks used to build the walls of the workings have something blue and green in them. These are copper minerals very typical for copper porphyry systems. They are malachite, which is the green mineral. And there is some bright blue azurite as well. Both are copper carbonate hydroxide minerals that form by oxidation of the primary copper sulfide ore minerals such as bornite, charcosite and charcopyrite. In fact, you can still find some rocks in the tailings here with charcopyrite and if you're lucky, you can find evidence of the breccia itself. Like this boulder here, you can see the breccia clasts surrounded by fractures carrying the copper sulfides. But the ore itself is long gone. The Brexia stockwork has been mined out, but the rest of the alteration halo around the porphyry still remains and provides here an excellent example to study the zonation around the copper porphyry. So let's do that and travel north from the Glass Deer mine. Our next stop takes us a couple of kilometers along the river. Up on this hill here, there are some quite good outcrops showing various alteration styles around the porphyry. Let's go have a look. Well, we are not very far from where the porphyry stockwork was mined and some of those rocks look really really green let's go and have a look well it's very green indeed quite a lot of this bright green stuff here that's malachite. So 
So there's Malachite, clear evidence of copper mineralization. Let's have a look at the country rock itself, what it's showing us. The country rock itself is quite green with chlorite and epidote. This, rather than the malachite mineralization that we happen to have here too, defines the alteration style here as propylitic. The micas in particular in the original schist have been altered to chlorite, giving the dark green tint to the rock. So, we got copper mineralization in the form of malachite, a little bit of chaga pyrus as well, and we got the greenish tinted rock with chlorite and epidote in them. A clear evidence that we are in the propylitic alteration zone of the porphyry. Let's continue our journey up the hill. We've walked up the forestry track and passed quite a few brownish looking outcrops. And there is something quite interesting in the woods here. Well, these outcrops look a bit rusty, don't they? They are quite rusty, with full of quite vivid reds and browns and yellows. This is very typical for rocks that have been interacting with acidic, iron and sulphur bearing fluids. If you look closely, you can actually see that the narrow fractures that crisscross the outcrop are actually full of pyrite, which is of course an iron sulphide. So this must have precipitated from the fluids. So, a lot of very, very strongly altered rocks here, a lot of pyrite. We are in the pyrite alteration halo of the porphyry. The rusty sulphide alteration halo is quite extensive and you can find similar rusty outcrops all along the track. And if you're lucky, you can find some tiny specks of charcoal pyrite and malachite. So further evidence of copper mineralization in the area But as we approach the top of the hill, we find something quite different. Right, so we've come to the top of the hill and let's look at that outcrop over there. Lots of complicated textures at this outcrop here. Let's have a look around and see a bit closer what we can find. There is a lot going on at this outcrop. The overall appearance is that the outcrop is very colourful and really pretty messy. There seems to be a yellowish rusty rock all over, not at all very different from what we've just seen a bit further down. But this rock is cut by veins that in some places are darker grey, in other places pale coloured. A closer inspection reveals that there is more than one type of vein in here. One type of lighter colour material cuts the rusty rocks. These veins look very altered, almost bleached. A 
they have, in turn, been brecciated by some dark grey veins. The darker grey rocks clearly contain a lot of pyrite, so the fluids that came in with this fracturing event would have been very rich in iron and sulphur. So very acidic and reactive, probably causing quite a lot of the alteration of the earlier rocks that we can observe here. Some of the rocks look almost like they've been bleached, like this one here. This is typical argilic alteration. This appearance is caused by the acidic hydrothermal fluids altering the feldspars in the original rock to clay minerals like kaolinite. But that's not all. There is another light-coloured rock here that seems to cross-cut everything else. It looks quite different too. It's more creamy, even pinkish in colour. And it also contains plenty of holes called vugs. These veins are mostly made out of carbonate minerals and quartz. The presence of carbonates suggests an evolution of the fluids so that this later fracturing event here was associated with fluids that had less sulphur in them. We can get a bit more information of the mineralization by looking at some samples from this outcrop in more detail. In fact, there is much more than just pyrite here. Scanning electron microscope analysis shows that we have the copper sulfides, charcoal pyrites and bornite present. And also some tenantite which is a copper arsenic sulfur salt. We can also find a little bit of the zinc sulfide sphalerite in the samples. The late carbonate veins are present too, showing how the metal rich mineralization is cross cut by these veins. So the field evidence shows that we're dealing with the more distal parts of the porphyry system. So we are in this epithermal mineralization part of the porphyry. And the field evidence also shows that we have multiple vein generations here and the system was evolving from more sulfide rich fluid system to more sort of intermediate sulfidation with carbonates coming in. So you can see how the alteration associated with the copper porphyry deposit can get really quite extensive even for a small deposit like last year. The alteration zonation here is relatively simple compared to many other porphyry systems that commonly involve several magmatic episodes. But even here there are clearly overlapping fluid and alteration episodes resulting from successive phases of fracturing and fluid flow. Such overprinting caused by various successive fluid pulses is very common in porphyry systems and can often make the alteration zonation very difficult to interpret. But large copper deposits of any kind are getting harder to find and despite increased exploration budgets for copper very few major copper discoveries have been made in the past 10 years. At the same time, the energy transition will result in an increased demand for copper. Copper demand is forecasted to increase by several hundred percent in the next couple of decades, 
and projections suggest that copper demand may exceed production rates before 2030. This magnitude of increase can't be met by more efficient recycling of copper, so the key question is, how can we meet our future copper demand to achieve a fast transition to lower carbon energy? There are no easy answers, but perhaps small-scale mining can be part of the solution. Either way, understanding the fundamental geological characteristics of copper deposits is more important than ever.